So please welcome Reverend Mark Gilbert. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, Linda, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you, Reverend Marty, for allowing me to be here today and be with you. And thank you all for being here. I send uh, greetings from home office in Golden, Colorado. I tell you, my favorite entry, we did this survey, and I got to see the survey monkey results when people were Vatican West. I liked that. That was my favorite that came in. <laughs> Uh, but we ended, up, we ended up deciding on home office, and that, that was wonderful. Um, today, our talk, our, our, my title for the talk is uh, Our Evolutionary Journey, What's Next? Our Evolutionary Journey, What's Next? And I know from talking to Reverend Marty that you guys are really on an evolutionary journey here with your community. And I really honor you for stepping up and, and being in that space of growth that you can move to a, not only a new place in consciousness, but a new place physically to meet and to come together in love and, uh, and celebration of this philosophy. And know that in doing that, it's going to attract uh, many more people to your community and uplift the consciousness of the planet. And that's really what we're talking about today, is the very fact that we are each individual little pockets of consciousness that are on an evolutionary journey, that we come together in, in the approximately 400 centers for spiritual living around the world that I get to work with that uh, are all uh, aggregated pockets of consciousness that are all serving to bring love and the philosophy of oneness on the planet. So I honor you for coming together and growing and bringing yourselves to that, uh, to that place. Um, today, we're talking about three things. We're going to be talking about what is evolution. When I say evolutionary journey, what's next? I have to always start with a little discussion about what do we mean by evolution. And the second thing is what's next, that's the logical thing there, is because we are at some point where I feel like uh, the planet and humanity collectively is moving to something new. There is a birthing, and I think if you talk to most people, you get that sort of sense that we're on a cusp of really shifting from what was humanity to a new vision of humanity. And, and the third thing is why even care about this? Why is this pertinent to me as an individual going about my day-to-day -day affairs? And so that's, that's the three things we're going to be talking about. Hope you can join us for the workshop this afternoon or, or check out the book and I'd be glad to sign it uh, for you this afternoon or right after service. Um, and let me just say one thing about that because it's, if, you're a if you're a student of the philosophy of Ernest Holmes and science of mind, like I am, and I've been studying this stuff for years and years and years, it took a new leap in my awareness of what Holmes wrote about when I shifted and saw a, put an evolutionary lens to what he was talking about. I went back and reread Holmes and I understood him from a different level when I understood how much he was talking about in terms of why we are here and why we are on an evolutionary path. So what do I mean by evolution? You know, in our culture today, we tend to look at evolution as being a, uh, an either or kind of thing. We either have this thing called material evolution or we have a total denial of it by the fundamentalist religions. And that's the entire aspect of how uh, evolution is presented to us as a people. And that's what we were trained in, in uh, school. Uh, most of us are familiar with the biology class and where we were taught Darwinian evolution. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Darwinian evolution, but just to refresh those brain cells for a moment, what Darwin came about in his theory of evolution was that over time, material things, i.e. plants and animals, evolved under a process that involved three, th three different aspects of it. One was that the parent passed on to its offspring, whether it was an animal or a plant, the characteristics of the parent. That's part one. Part two was sometimes in the transmission of that there are changes or alterations, mutations. And sometimes those changes, third part, are a better fit for the environment. And so as that plant or animal is interweaving its relationship with the physical, the changes as it hands itself off to the offspring, those offspring who are better fitted for that environment will propagate, they'll grow, they'll live longer, they'll have more offspring. Hence, that's the basic theory of the, of the survival of the fittest. Well, that's what we tend to think of as being evolution. And when we, when we step back and look at that, we consider it as all being physical, material stuff, right? We don't really tend to think about evolution from a being uh, uh, another aspect or another being. In fact, the realm of the interior, the realm of consciousness, the realm of something that transcends the physical, comes from religion. And what's our religious faiths have been telling us for so many years is that that thing over there, evolution, doesn't exist. 
And if you have a strict, material, a strict fundamentalist religious belief that says, you know, that the Bible or whatever your religious book is inherent word of God, and it says the planet's only 6,000 years old, it's very difficult for you to adopt a, a philosophy or scientific theory that has to invo involve millions of years on the planet and say that's true. So there's been this sort of either or. Now, over time, because the science has proved that theory correct, there's been an evolution in the fundamentalist beliefs to bring about things like uh, intelligent design as a, a, the, the theory that where there is an end, uh, uh, some maker came in and inserted themselves in the process at critical points, and that allows us to adjust for the timeline. So it makes, makes sense for it. But what we teach here and what Ernest Holmes taught was that it wasn't simply an either or. That evolution really is a process that's a melding of the material evolution, which is truly a fact, with a evolution of the inner realm as well. And in fact, it's in our inner realm, in our consciousness, in our awareness, in those thoughts and feelings that we have within us and how they are adjusting and changing is truly where most of the evolution is occurring at this point on the planet. And so what, it's, what we're called to do in Students of Science of Mind is to bring these two together, to acknowledge the physical evolution of, the, of all that's occurred, but to also acknowledge that our own lives individually, and if we look back and look at the history of mankind and humanity through all time, and if we look at the various aspects of our cultural changes over time, we can recognize that there's a pattern of evolution that's occurring there as well. I mean, even in the last number of years, we can look at changes in the mores of our society where people have collectively become more acceptance of same-sex marriage, where we can see that our ev there's been an evolution in the consciousness of the United States. What I want to do is, is to, however, run through a little exercise that I think will anchor this evolution of consciousness concept into you. And what I want to do is tell you the life, my life story, and I'm going to do this briefly. And I'm going to stop at various points in my life. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, every stopping point, I'm going to ask myself three questions. And what I want you to do is to ask yourself the same three questions. And I want you to visualize yourself at the same point in life that, I, that I'm describing myself at. So we're going to stop along the way, and I'm going to stop around preschool age, then the grade school, then high school, then young adulthood, and then now. And that's where I'm going. So I'm going to hearken back to my preschool days. And I can remember pretty much where I was because my father got transferred with his job and we were in different towns and I sort of knew where I was by the, the city that we lived in. But in my early years of preschool, up to about age four, I lived in this town where my earliest, oh, did I tell you the three questions yet? I didn't, I left that part out. Well, he's gonna harken back to it. The three questions we're gonna ask at every step along the way are these. First question, how big is your world? How big is your world? There's, we have a mental concept of how big it is. The second question is, how big is your circle of care and concern? How big is the circle of people that you care about at that point in your life? And the third thing I want you to ask yourself at that point along the way is, what was your vision of God at that point in time? All right, so these inner awareness, inner growth. So let's go back to preschool. My, when I was young, we had uh, lived in this one town where all of my memories of, that, of being in that place were of the house that we lived in, the yard right around the house, the back seat of the car, but not above the level where you could look out the glass. <laughs> and then I had a nanny who took care of me, and I remember going to her place, and I have vague recollections of that as well. Fairly small place. Who did I have care and concern about at that point in my life? I'll be honest, it was about me. I mean, I remember my parents. I remember my brother. I had no care and concern about him. But there was my... Also... Uh, you know, the nanny, I had a lot of care and concern about her. If you get the book, you'll read the story about that. And the whole idea was that basically I had a fairly small people that I cared about. And if I really thought about it logically, I didn't really care that much about them. It was all about me. What was my vision of God at that age? I don't think I had one. I think it was, again, it was all about me. Very egotistical at that young age. I really, I was so self-centered about who I was that I didn't have a sense of a transcendent something outside of me. Okay? Let's fast forward a few years. Early grade school. First to third grade kind of thing. All right. We were in a different town, and I remember the, uh, where we lived that I had a, uh, my world got a little bit bigger. 
I remember not only the house I lived in and the yard around it, but I remember the neighborhood because I was out visiting around with friends and neighbors around me. I remember getting on my bicycle and riding down the hill and buying comic books at the store at the bottom of the hill. I remember going to my schools and the classrooms and the playgrounds. And so all of a sudden, the world got a little bit bigger. And who did I start caring about? Well, I started caring about people then. I really cared about my parents, and I started caring a little bit about my brother. And there was my relatives and then there were these students in the school, and I remember having crushes on the teachers, you know. And uh, so my care and concern got a little bit bigger. And what was my vision of God? Well, at this time, I started having some thoughts about there must be something outside me that's driving all of this reality that I'm experiencing. And this honed in for me on a story that I remember where I was in second grade, and this uh, new girl came into class, and the teacher put her across the other side of the room at a desk that was distant from me. And I thought, man, it would be so cool if I could sit next to that girl, because she is so cute. And so I went home that night, and I thought, OK, I'm gonna, I know there are powers outside of me, and I'm going to draw on those powers to move me across the room to next to that girl. So I, I knew there was some power in four-leaf clovers. So I went out and started picking four-leaf clovers out of the yard. Remember that? Anybody ever do that? Four-leaf? Yeah, they had power, didn't they? <laughs> And I got all those four-leaf clovers, and I clutched them in my hand, and I laid down on the ground in the grass, and I looked up at the sky, at the clouds, because I knew there was some old guy up there with a beard <laughs> who was going to answer my prayer. So clutching my clover and giving my prayer to the old guy in the sky, I said, please move me over to that girl. That was my vision of God. That was my vision of God, sort of a nature, external being conglomeration. But what happened? You want to know what happened? Next day, I got moved next to that girl. It was wonderful. Now, I looked back and thought, man, it would have been wonderful if I'd prayed to the guy in the sky and held my clover and said, give me the courage to talk to her. But <laughs> so I sat there silently the rest of the year. <laughs> but that was my vision of God. So let's move forward a little, a few years. Now I'm in high school. And uh, Remember turning 16 and getting that driver's license, and you can, you can drive around now. You got a job, meeting people, dating some girl at the other side of town or in another high school. Okay. My world got bigger. My world got bigger. I remember my, I can visualize the sense of where I went and where I, and even on vacations, we were going more distant places. So the world got to be a bigger place. And who did I have care and concern about? Well, not only was it people I'd cared about before, but it expanded to new people, people that were unlike me that worked at the job where I worked, people who were unlike me that were at that other high school. I was running into a larger and larger, more and more different people, so I cared about a greater number of people. It was my vision of God. Well, that's an interesting story there, and it's sometimes what people always point out. It's always about girls, Mark, but it was at this time because I was dating this young, this young girl that um, she went to a fairly traditional faith uh, church, and they had a practice in this church that basically uh, did a thing where if you were touched during the service, you know, you come down to the front. It's called altar calls. Probably, you know, you've probably experienced these. Well, I had, you know, I was attracted to this girl, you know, and I wanted to keep dating her. But at the end of the service, when the, the preacher said, you know, if you've been touched, come on down, she's elbowing me. <laughs> like, aren't you going to go down? And I'm thinking, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not going down there. <laughs> but it was a choice point, because I'm also thinking, oh, I want to date her, but not that much. <laughs> so there was a real uh, a sense of I had to, to be true to who I was in my, my faith and my belief of what was real, more so than to give in to, to what you know, I often call the raging hormone stage. <laughs> so, but my vision of God, I, here's the point I want you to give you. There was a shift. I was letting go of the old man and the sky God. I had moved through that and was now questioning and recognizing that really what it was being taught in that traditional faith didn't speak truth to me at that point in my life. That's why it changed. Let's go forward a few more years. Now I'm young and I'm married, and as you heard, I had five kids and triplets and all of that by the time I was 25. And much of my life got consumed by job and career, making money, etc. How big was my world? The world got bigger. My world got bigger because now I was traveling, I was traveling all across the United States with work. I was encountering many more people who were much different from me and liking them. So my care and concern in my world just got really big. 
And what was my, my sense of God like at that point in time? It's an interesting mixture. It, it, to me, it was almost a release of the old sky, external God. And I really wasn't thinking that much about God. When I did, it was, let's try out Eastern religions and see what they say. There was still that sort of undercurrent of searching. But there ha I had not locked into some true vision of, what I had, of, of finding anything yet. All right, let's fast forward up to, up to present day. And probably in the last you know, 15, 20 years, I can see my life has totally shifted, leaving the role of the government, becoming science and mind minister, working for the headquarters of this organization, and feeling called to be of service to uplifting consciousness of the planet. Now, as I'm a new wife, we've been together 10 years, grandchildren on the way, we have these wonderful expansiveness things where the world is bigger. We're traveling the world. We're meeting lots and lots of people. And, but even around our kids and grandkids, we all come together in these blended families of exes and so forth with surrounded love around these children. That's an expanded vision of what I had thought was possible even when I was younger. And so now I'm at a place where, how big is my world? It's big. What's my circle of care and concern? It's expansive. What's my vision of God? It's now shifted to where I recognize that there is a power, a presence, an intelligence, a force, an energy that permeates everything, that we swim in this ocean of God energy, that something called mind with a capital M is embedded in everything. And now I have the vision of a, a God, which sometimes I have to get away from the word God because when I'm talking to other people, I say, what do you mean by God? Because they, they may be applying the old definition, which is why we often use spirit or other words, to recognize that we're really talking about a transcendent power that's embedded in everything, and it moves through us and gives us our being. Well, what I want you to see is along this path, along this story, we've been talking about the evolution of my consciousness. And if you've been making the same sort of thoughts about your own life, you've been seeing how you've been evolving at the same time. Is every step along the way, you have shifted. You've changed in terms of how big your world is, your care and concern, and your vision of God. And we could go through other questions and get that same sort of sense of shift. Okay. But the question now becomes, what's next? Because we back to this point that we feel like we're on the cusp of something. And i got to stop and acknowledge that you're going to encounter people who are different points on the path. And that's OK, because where they are is where they are for their life and what their circumstances are. And we've got to honor and know there's a perfection in that process so that when we encounter people, who believe differently than we do on issues, we know that where they are, there is a divine perfection for them. So bless them, honor them, agree to disagree on certain points, but love them anyway. So what's next for us? Well, for, for us, you know, we, there are people who have been way showers, who have gone ahead of us, who have looked at the higher levels of consciousness and have reported back to us and said, here's the next steps of where we're going. In fact, that was one of the, um, I've, I got a chance to do this a couple of times, uh, write occasionally for Science of Mind magazine, and they had asked me to do a presentation over at Golden at the headquarters last year. It's out on YouTube if you want to go find it. It's about an hour long. But I went back through like 60 years of Science of Mind magazines looking at articles on evolution and what they said was the path of evolution of where we were going and looking for common themes. I had just done that for the book that's, that's available, where I had looked at books like Ken Wilber and Spiral Dynamics and Rumi and Meister Eckhart, Ernest Holmes, and a bunch of other people to see what they say where we're going in terms of evolution, what's next. And I found from that a number of common themes. And let me just run through some of these real quickly. I'm not going to run through all of them, but I want to give you a sense of the flavor of what some of these scientists and philosophers and mystics are saying is the next step in our evolutionary journey. Well, first off, they say there's greater complexity in all our systems. You can probably acknowledge that's occurring. Greater ability to consciously control the evolutionary process, which basically means you recognize you've got the power to direct where evolution's going. Right beforehand, it's been sort of like hit or miss. Now we can direct it. The other thing they say is, is happening is that there's going to be a place where we let go of, a, of an attention on basic needs and all move to a place of higher needs or spiritual needs, where everyone has their basic needs met. We use the term create a world that works for everyone in science of mind. 
which basically acknowledges we're creating a world where everyone has the opportunity to have their basic needs of air, water, safety, food, et cetera, met, and then the opportunities for education and expansion to go to the higher needs in their life. These people say that's where we're going. Okay. Greater levels of cooperation among people. We'll be talking this afternoon about sometimes it doesn't seem that way, but I think that's a point that puts us on a threshold here. And also, there is this sense that there is a melding of science and spirituality, which we do teach here at, at Religious Science. That there is an increased emphasis on people finding their lives calling or purpose. I like to point out, because most people are familiar with Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. How many people read that book? Good number of you. How many read his sequel called The Eighth Habit? A couple of you did. A lot of people forget that Covey evolved. <laughs> Covey moved to a level, he said, there's something better than effectiveness, it's called greatness. He made it its eighth habit, and his eighth habit was really about finding your inner calling, living it, and helping others to find theirs. He saw it. He saw that was the next step on the evolutionary journey. There's also in this the common theme of us all getting to a place of recognition of unity and oneness, which is a basic concept that's taught in Centers for Spiritual Living. That's where they said, you can go watch the YouTube and you can hear very common themes from the resources of people who wrote for Science of Mind the last 60 years. What did Ernest Holmes say, the person who founded our philosophy? I'll read you just a couple of quick quotes out of Ernest. Because he did actually write about where evolution is going. I like this quote because he, this is where he acknowledges the, the tie together of the material and the consciousness, the, that the evolution is both playing out on the material side as well as the non-material side. He said, the universe, both visible and invisible, is a spiritual system. Man's a part of this spiritual order, so indivisibly united with it that the entire cosmos is or may be reflected in his mind. Evolution, this is a key sentence, Evolution is the awakening of the soul to its recognition of its unity with the whole. It's the awakening within you of your awareness that you're unified with all that is. That's what the whole purpose of evolution is about. He gives a great example uh, in the book about the evolution of locomotion, which I just love. I'm going to run through this quickly. He says, it seems as though behind evolution there's an irresistible pressure compelling more, better, higher, greater things. For instance, if we study the evolution of locomotion from the rising of man from the clod, we see him riding upon a horse, then in a cart, then in a wagon, and so on to the automobile and the airplane. What is this but the evolution of locomotion? The unfolding through man's mind of the possibilities of travel. What is the inevitable end of locomotion? Could it be other that we shall ultimately do away with every visible means of transportation? When we shall have unified with omnipresence, we shall be omnipresent. When we've unified in our minds with the oneness, we'll be everywhere at the same time. When we shall have arrived at sufficient understanding, our thought will take us where we wish to be. When we know enough, we'll be able to pass on to another plane and come back again, if we wish to do so. When we know enough to multiply the loaves and fishes, we shall do so. When we know enough to walk on the water, we'll be able to do that, and it will be in accordance with natural law in a spiritual world. This is where he says we're going. Now the question then becomes, it says, I can't walk on water, Mark. <laughs> I'm not there yet. I can't do these things. And this is why what's next for you is so critical and why this co concept of evolution is important for you is to think about what is next for you. Because here's the end game we're talking about. But you're somewhere in your awareness, maybe a little bit below that. I'm, I'm saying that, but I, for, I'm, let me, I'm really talking about myself. I know I can't walk on water. I know I'm not there yet. And I know that most people I talk to tell me that. <laughs> that, they can't, that, that, that they can't walk on water. <laughs> they can't walk on water. Anybody here walk on water? <laughs> a, couple, a couple of people. <laughs> when it's frozen, somebody's told me that one before. <laughs> but what you want to know is, basically, 
what, is, what can I do now? What is the next step for me now in my personal evolution? Holmes actually wrote about this as well. He says, and I love this because it summarizes our philosophy in just a couple of sentences. The science of mind is based entirely on the supposition that we're surrounded by a universal mind into which we think. Let's stop there for half a second. We're swimming in a notion of something called mind energy. We tend to think our minds are what's in our head, but that's our individual use of something that we're immersed in. That's what he's saying. Okay. This mind in its original state fills all space. It fills all space that man uses in the universe. It is as man, in man as well as outside of him. As he thinks into this universal mind, he sets a law in motion, which is creative, and then contains within itself limitless possibilities. He's basically telling us through the use of our power of thoughts, we're thinking into this one mind and we can create whatever way we want. We can eventually get to that state of where we can walk on water and do all that other stuff. He says, however, the law through which man operates is infinite, but man appears to be finite. That is, he's not yet evolved to a complete understanding of himself. He is unfolding from a limitless potential but can bring into his experience only what he can conceive. There's no limit to the law, but there appears to be a limit to man's understanding of it. And as his understanding unholds, his possibilities of attainment will increase. Holmes is telling us where we're going is that state where we're omnipresent, where we have that state of creative ability, where we know that we know and we can do whatever we wish. But wherever we are, we have to start where we are. So that's why this is important. Starting where we are, Moving to the next thing of being the next thought that's more creative, to the next step of who we can be, the next step of being of service to the planet. The next step for you is perfect, but you need to take that next step in consciousness. Not slide down the hill backwards into the mire of negativity and negative thinking, but to move to the shift of positive thinking everywhere in your life is a little bit better, a little bit better. And the other reason why this is important is because if you've got kids or grandkids like I do, You've got people that you've got to care and concern about, then you want to create and see a planet where we all get to that space of oneness and love and a total understanding. I want those, when I see my granddaughter, and I got a third one on the way, and I know we'll all be around in the room, my blessing for that girl is that she is inheriting a world that works for everyone, that she's inheriting a world where she's got the possibilities to create whatever she wants. We take care of the planet, and we take care of each other. But it starts with us. It starts with us caring. It starts with us taking the next step where we are and answering that call within us to be whoever we're supposed to be on the planet. So I invite you this day to do that, to move to that place where you know that you know, that you know as your life is unfolding the highest possibilities of who it can be, that you know that you can create whatever you want. You know that you are surrounded by loving people. Prosperity, abundance, love, greatness, grandness, everything is available to you. Shift in this day in that slight way to whatever it can be to take that next step. Let's go there in prayer now. And as we just allow these words to anchor into our awareness, as we know that these little individual pockets of consciousness that we are, that we sit here and see ourselves as being different and apart from one another, that we know that's just a, an illusion, an experience that we are moving through on this evolutionary path. We know that the divine spirit, God, infinite intelligence has embedded with us all of the power and awareness and consciousness that is creative and is embedded in everything that is. That all of us swim in that same ocean of mind energy. And as we allow ourselves to allow the barriers between ourselves and others to slowly be let down and to allow our awareness and attention to shift out to see our sense of connectedness to others as we shift the size of our world to even being a little bit bigger, as we shift our care and concern, the circle of people that we love to be inclusive of even more people, and as we allow our vision of that God to be that mind that's embedded in all to see the perfection of life that we know that we know. I know for each and every person here that no matter what challenge you may be faced with in your individual circumstances in your life, that this day you are putting that down you're shedding it like an old garment, setting it aside and saying, today I claim greatness. Today I claim the next step of my life, whatever it am called to experience. I know that love is mine, not only to receive, but to give. 
that I know that I am a force for good upon this planet. I know that I have a special gift that I've been given and allow myself to accept my gift, live it fully, and give it back in service to my fellow humans. Let me answer my calling this day and help others find theirs. And in that, we'll create a world that works for everyone. Thank you, God. Thank you, God.